Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I really do appreciate it. On today's show, I'm talking to Tushar Shanda, co-founder and head of research at Row Asset Management. Tushar is the author of a number of books on the topic of how to design rule-based trading systems, as well as having been actively trading these systems for more than 20 years. So he brings real unique insight to what it takes to design and run a successful systematic trading program. For those of you who are new to the show, I just want to let you know that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode on the toptradersonplugged.com website. Now let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Tushar, good morning. It's uh, Niels. Morning, Niels. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, Tushar, before we uh, jump into all the specific questions that uh, we want to cover today um, and uh, sort of the structure of uh, our conversation, I thought I would just try and go back a little bit um, because I think it's important that people, uh, when they are looking at uh, an investment advice, also get to know, um, you know, the people behind the company and and some of the thoughts that have gone into uh, where they are. So perhaps with that in mind, uh, if you could just spend uh, a little bit of time uh, just to take us back to uh, so, sort of your own background and, and how you got first into the whole world of trading and particular maybe of interest, it would be why you ended up choosing the systematic route, which is, of course, still uh, the smallest part of the uh, investment universe. Well, my background is in engineering. Uh, uh, I came from a, a, a high-powered R&D background because I have a PhD in engineering and I used to do a lot of mathematical modeling and a lot of uh, simulations, uh, try to understand and describe the underlying process. So for me, it was a fairly natural uh, way or natural transition to primarily use quantitative methods and therefore the systematic approach uh, was... Uh, in keeping with my training and my uh, ability to solve problems. Uh, now, uh, what we had to recognize is that when I worked uh, as a scientist or an engineer, I worked in a world of cause and effect. That is, we believe that there were some underlying rules of the road or natural process or phenomena that we needed to understand in order to predict what was going to happen. Now, what I found interesting about uh, trading or the markets was that fundamentally they were a random situation or a random event or a, group, a bunch of random events. That is, there was no fundamental cause and effect. So an, another way to think about it is for the same set of inputs in the for a model of the equity markets, you can get a very large range of outputs. So it's very difficult to just make a uh, relatively straightforward study of the markets and come up with some explanatory variables that are going to work the, that efficiently or that well for an ever and ever into the future. So uh, that sort of explains my background and also my general interest in uh, trading in particular. And then I was also quite interested by the uh, fact that uh, there, was, uh, there was an ability for you to be original by doing something interesting in terms of your research in order to deal with the inherent randomness in the markets. So even though the markets were random, uh, you could still try to find some rules that allowed you to react to the market differently than someone else. So uh, sort of a combination of the 
uh, where my training and background came from and uh, you know this uh, the curiosity of somebody that was trying to move or deal with a structured situation versus a predominantly random situation and of course you've also done other things too shar i mean uh, developing systems uh, have been a very big part of uh, of your life but uh, but uh, i guess also it's worth mentioning that uh, you certainly also spend uh, your fair share of time uh, writing about it and trying to explain to other people how a good system should be designed and 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 how you can actually go about uh, testing these things would that be a fair assessment yes uh, i've uh, published many articles uh, uh, over time and i've uh, written a uh, couple of books uh, one of which has gone into a second edition called beyond technical analysis and has been translated into many languages across the world so uh, i think it's been in- an interesting journey in terms of uh, being able to uh, communicate my understanding and models for the markets uh, to a wider audience excellent well let's um, let's not keep away from all the uh, the good stuff we're going to talk uh, 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 about today and and of course um, the program we're going to be uh, debating is uh, the row altus program and perhaps you can just give me a brief overview uh, of the program that uh, you run and and also just when it started and and how much uh, asset under management you run in the program today. Right. So uh, uh, the program started in November of 2007, and we're running somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 million plus minus on the program. And then uh, the program is a uh, medium-term sort of trend-following program. But what's interesting about the program is that we've tried to uh, think like discretionary traders and try to capture many different types of behavior into a single program. So we have different groups of systems that represent different types of approaches to the market. So for example, uh, if you are a bank and you said, okay, we want to start a trading desk and then you'd go out and hire traders from other banks that might have individual niches or preferences or skills. So you may buy, you know, or you may hire somebody that's a good bond trader. You may go out and buy somebody who's a good energy trader. You may go out and hire somebody or find somebody who is good at currencies and so on. And each of these people would bring a different approach to their individual area of expertise. And we've already discussed that the markets are random. So what we did was we did something. We wanted to follow that approach. We did something a little different. We said we're going to use the same rules on all markets. So that makes it very robust. So in a way, we're not uh, using different rules for different markets as each of your specialized traders might. But we're trying to capture, even in these uh, uniform rules, some of the behavioral styles uh, of individual discretionary traders. So for example, one of the advantages that discretionary traders have is they can vary the size of their position, that is the size of the initial risk, based on their conviction about the trade. So there may be something in the information environment uh, that allows them to change size. So for example, uh, uh, when the new prime minister was elected in Japan, he was elected on a mandate to uh, pump up the economy and increase the uh, growth rate and the inflation rate. So this is an external piece of information that a discretionary trader could have used to increase his or her size in, say, the Japanese yen or the, or the Nikkei uh, equity market. Now, as a mechanical system that uses all the same rules in all the markets, we don't have the luxury of factoring in explicitly the, a different piece of information for every new trade. However, we have some rules built in that allow us to change the size of the position uh, going into a market. So that's an example of where we've tried to think about how a discretionary trader might approach a problem but we have converted that into some rule-based algorithms that we can apply over and over again without necessarily being able to incorporate a specific piece of news from the real world into the models. Sure. Well, let's just uh, go through some of the sort of the, the more uh, tick box type uh, questions that I think is important for people just to uh, get familiar with. And that's a little bit about the organization and how you've dis, you know structured row asset management uh, perhaps you could just go into a little bit of detail about um, you know how it's done um, who does what and and also um, you know 
whether you use uh, outside uh, outsourced uh, parties to to help you in certain areas uh, or whether you do everything uh, in house right uh, we're based in uh, zug switzerland and uh, we have from day one used a very high level of automation for our uh, day-to-day trading reconciliation back office and record keeping purposes so, uh, for example, if you use uh, the U.S. regulatory standard as a reference, they have various guidelines for how uh, different bits of the trading process and the back office process and the record keeping process should work. So we've automated all of the uh, mechanical or repetitive aspects of the business as much as possible. Uh, but, of course, there's also value to outsourcing some functions because we get a third-party uh, uh, assessment or numbers or analysis of our performance. So, for example, our administration is partly outsourced, uh, accounting is partly outsourced, our legal and compliance um, uh, is partly outsourced, but, you know, we have a couple of lawyers on our board uh, and so on. So, uh, the, it's always a matter of striking a balance between doing everything in-house versus doing uh, everything outsourced. And uh, we feel that since we are primarily traders, and we have a, uh, a strong regulatory responsibility to our regulators and our clients. We try to automate uh, all the d- immediate trading-related tasks and uh, processes so that we can have tremendous control and consistency and disciplined execution at all times. And then, of course, even with that, it's good to go outside for some of the things like accounting and legal because uh, they can do it more efficiently. There's a, a distance, a standoff distance, an arm's length, uh, measurement of the performance and of course uh, uh, we're not strictly lawyers we're primarily traders that's not our interest so uh, to the extent that the organization uh, supports trading we've put, kept it in-house to the extent that uh, there's areas of expertise and uh, uh, advantages to having a arm's length transaction we've gone out of house so in other words i guess you could say that the sort of the key functions of research trading software development and of course client relations is kept in-house whilst as you mentioned some of the other functions uh, are outsourced in full or partly outsourced correct and when it comes to the underlying strategy that we're going to be discussing uh, today in particular um, would you say that there is an, an optimal size of the strategy that you see uh, on the horizon um, uh, and, 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 and at that point where you may say, well, we need to change the strategy or we may to do certain things differently in order to increase the capacity? I, I would say that the, uh, the, the capacity is well in excess of a billion dollars uh, US. And uh, certainly when we get to that point, uh, we may have to add more systems or uh, look at the execution issues in order to get the uh, appropriate control on slippage that we need to maintain the profitability of the system. Great. Tushar, you mentioned that the program started in November of 2007 and obviously since that time it's been an interesting journey not least for people in the CTA industry. Would you say that um, the program itself has performed in term with your expecta- or in line with your expectations? And, and obviously, I guess we need to, to take into account that uh, many uh, programs uh, have performed quite differently before 2009 and after 2009. And uh, is that something that the Altus program has, has experienced as well? Uh, the short answer is yes, that uh, the the fund has performed differently after 2009 than before 2009. Uh, has it generally performed as designed? The short answer is yes, and the long answer is uh, we wish we had done better. Essentially, what you have to think about is you have to think about the macro environment, the external environment within which the fund has had to trade. So to give you an idea, uh, if you are a, f- a fan of Formula One, uh, you know that the cars are very highly optimized for each circuit. But the circuit is a static object. We pretty much know where all the turns are going to be. Now, if it rains during the on race day, the performance of the F1 cars falls off dramatically. Why is that? Because even the best drivers need optimal conditions to perform at a world-class level. Another analogy I can give you is that of golfers. If you look at the greatest golfers today or 50 years ago, all of them... Uh, are optimized to perform when the 
course conditions are perfect and they get to practice on the course for a week or longer so they pretty much know where every hazard is and where every bunker is and where every tree is. Now, what happens to these world-class golfers when the wind picks up? Well, their, goal, their scores pick up as well. So if I told you that somebody scored a par for the third round, uh, you really can't evaluate that score without knowing uh, how the rest of the field is done and what the environment was. So if on a very windy day, uh, turning in a par score might actually be a phenomenally uh, strong or successful round. So the same thing happened to the CTA industry and to our program as a whole. Due to the uh, incredible uh, credit crisis and crack up of Lehman Brothers, we had a massive uh, breakdown in the entire world trading system uh, so that the uh, central banks had to intervene and so forth. So essentially what happened was the markets were working in a particular way before, uh, say, 2007, 2008, and everybody's systems, including ours, were sort of designed to perform under those kinds of markets where you had maybe a year or two of uh, weak performance and then very strong trends so you could recover and make uh, continue to make new equity highs. What happened after 2009 or 2008, depending on where you draw the line, uh, was that uh, most, virtually all of the trends were limited to the equity markets and the bond markets. So the people who had uh, very strong positions or exposure to these markets with very slow moving systems tended to do better as a group than everyone else. And we are part of that everyone else because we are a highly diversified trader. We don't overweight any particular sector relative to another sector. We sort of have uh, more or less uh, well uh, or significant exposure to all of the major groups in the market. Uh, so, uh, so again, to go back to the golf analogy or the FR analogy, the trading environment has been unusually difficult for the last five years. So just to give you an idea, we use a row trend barometer which measures the percentage of markets that are trending or have reasonable trends at the end of every month. And the break-even level is about, say, 42.5% to 45%. So if the market, so say, if only 20% of the markets are trending, then typically trend followers tend to lose one standard deviation in terms of uh, return for the month. So uh, the more months you have above break-even, the more likely you are to be profitable. So if you look at the five-year period ending in 2009 and the five years after that, what you find is that uh, there are many more months below break even after 2009 than there were before 2009. So that just tells you that since inception for our program, more than two thirds of the months have been below break even. So that just gives you an idea of how difficult the environment has been for our program uh, specifically and for uh, diversified trend followers in general. So uh, it's sort of raining uh, during every race, if you will, if you want to use the F1 calendar or it's been a very windy condition for all the majors, if you want to use a golf analogy. So uh, for us, uh, the, the system has done what it could, given the very uniquely difficult trading circumstances. Um, but of course, uh, you know, since we didn't have uh, large exposure to equities and bonds, our performance in absolute terms uh, looks worse when you compare it to managers who overweighted in those particular sectors. So overall, I'd say the system has done what it was designed to do. And... One thing we know from the uh, CTA industry is, of course, that uh, many managers have very long and, and prestigious track records. But when you look at them, of course, we also have to be aware that there uh, usually has been quite a lot of uh, evolution and changes along the road in order to get to uh, where they are today. And therefore, just looking at numbers historically, um, I guess, uh, you know, can give you a little bit of a, a false sense of comfort. Would you say that there are sort of uh, particular ranges of time looking at your own track record that we should be aware and where maybe perhaps major research uh, uh, upgrades have happened just to put that into perspective um, and, and so we know what we're dealing with uh, in, in, in that sense? Yes, Neil, sir. Uh when you look at somebody that has, say, a 20-year track record, you can be almost sure that what they're doing today in terms of systems and market rates uh, are quite different from what they were doing 20 years ago. And uh, that's uh, partly driven by the manager's own research. It's partly driven by the customers because they want us to do research all the time and, quote, make things better. And then, of course, there's a natural reaction to what may be happening to AUM, to liquidity, as different markets are uh, become available to trade or become too thin to trade and so on and so forth. So uh, 
when you look at a manager's performance, it's good to look at the environment within which the performance was produced uh, using something like the road trend barometer. Or you certainly need to ask the question, have there been you know, significant changes or even small changes uh, to the track record or to the systems and the portfolio weights and how that has played out uh, uh, over the time and how that correlates with the track record. Because, for example, uh, with exactly the same system, I could produce quite different looking track records by overweighting a particular sector or underweighting a particular sector. So, yes, that's something that uh, the user needs to be uh, aware of and certainly need to inquire about. And in case of the Altus program, would you say that there are two or three periods that are, um, you know, uh, different um, because of research upgrades in, 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 in that case? Well, I would say roughly two periods. We've tried not to make too many changes. And uh, in fact, we, we, have, we started with three systems and now we have six systems. And uh, most of the original systems we have uh, continue to be used today with some minor changes. So uh, roughly, I would say uh, late 2010, early 2011 is a good time for us to uh, differentiate our track record because we made some significant changes as a result of various uh, things that happened in 2009 and 2010. Uh, but overall, uh, we've so there are roughly two periods in our track record, and I'm sure we're happy to provide you with more specific details if you desire. Uh, but in general, uh, there has been uh, the and going back to the previous question, you do have to be aware of uh, when changes were made and uh, what was done, and uh, you know how that uh, altered returns, uh, so that it's not a it's not the result of applying the same rules uh, across the entire track record. Sure. And, and since we are talking about the, the track record, maybe I could just ask you a few sort of uh, very simple questions just again for the listeners to uh, get a feel for what's inside uh, the, the track record. Um, do you, uh, are you able to give us a, a hint of roughly in terms of the average uh, fee structure that you have in your track record day today, what would you say that that is? Uh, it's very close to the industry benchmark of 2 and 20. That is a uh... Two uh, percent of management fee and twenty percent of incentive fees. Okay, and in terms of the commissions uh, being charged to the trading, um, what would you say they are? Sort of approximately. I would say about say ten dollars US, uh, you know, approximately. <laughs> and of course, there's also uh, there's always a downside to the CTA and to any investment. And uh, so, just uh, highlighting those numbers as well in terms of the the maximum drawdown, meaning from a a high to a low. Uh, how has that been uh, in the uh, live trading since uh, November '07? Right. So uh, the rule of thumb that we use is that the worst drawdown is typically four times the monthly standard deviation. So our monthly standard deviation is something on the order of 5.1%. So if you multiply that by, that by four, we should get something on the range of 20%. So our worst drawdown has been 22%, which was back in February of 2010, which is just a little bit higher than this 4X, but it's in the basic range of, say, you know, three to five times standard deviation. So we've done a good job of controlling our risk in this extremely difficult environment. Now, what does that mean? If you look at, uh, many diversified CTAs. Uh, we've not seen our worst drawdown expand dramatically in the last year or two, uh, meaning we've stayed well within this 22% drawdown, whereas many of our uh, cohorts in the business have had significant increases in their worst drawdown by a factor of 50% or 100% even in the last few years. So as a, uh, I'm an optimist, so I like to say that your best month is ahead of you and, and your worst month is also ahead of you. And essentially, in 2013, that came true for many programs. Uh, but we were able to uh, maintain and stay above our worst drawdown uh, even in the last year or two. Excellent. And just just to sort of finalize these sort of uh, short uh, statistics, um, looking at your average winning month and your average losing month, how, how does that compare? One of the things we like to do is we like to use a statistic that we like to call offense-defense ratio, which is the ratio of the average winning month divided by the average losing month. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you're trying to get an idea for how quickly does the system or the program respond when there are good opportunities in the market. So you want to put on positions, increase risk when there are opportunities in the market, so your average winning month will go up. Conversely, uh, when the things are difficult, when there are no trends, you want to shrink the number of positions or reduce your risk in the market so that the average losing month will go down. So naturally, the better you are at responding to opportunity or shrinking during adversity, 
then this ratio will be more than one and will be relatively large uh, compared to some people who are not as sensitive to responding to what's happening in the market. So for example, for us, the average winning month is 4.65%. The average losing month is 3.42%. So to give us an offense-defense ratio of 1.36 in very, very difficult market conditions. And that's significantly better than many of the other programs, uh, especially when you compare diversified traders to diversified traders. Uh, some of them are at one or a little bit less than one. Um, and it's not that their systems are not very good. It just means that the trading conditions have been very difficult. But even in these difficult trading conditions, you can see that our systems have been able to respond aggressively when conditions are favorable and shrink or reduce our risk quickly when conditions are not. And then finally, I guess a number that's also somewhat relevant, and that is, of course, uh, the percentage of, of winning month, uh, even though I know the period has been probably a period where the general CTA index have been uh, also suffering from a lack of winning month. But uh, do you happen to know how, how the Altius program have done? Yes, yeah, so our percentage of winning months is uh, approximately 47%. So it's a little bit lower than we would like, but uh, you know the markets have been tough, and uh, you know that's the way it shook out. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, trading program itself, and perhaps you—I know you mentioned the structure of it briefly at the beginning, but perhaps you could just, in your own words, talk a little bit about um, the the overall structure, the number of markets and sectors you trade, and also give an ins insight to. Uh, the instruments that you've chosen uh, for the Altius program. Okay, Niels, uh, going back to where we were, uh, we are trend followers and we are medium term trend followers, but we want to be a little bit different than the traditional trend follower. Now, uh, in terms of markets and uh, portfolio, we trade 44 markets. We are very diversified in terms of and with roughly similar weights on all the major sectors. So we trade, you know, currencies, bonds. Uh, interest rates, equities, which are kind of the primary sector that everybody does. We also trade a lot of commodities. So our commodity weights is uh, markets are roughly more than half of the markets we trade are commodity markets. So we have a bit of a commodities orientation uh, versus a orientation towards finance or financials compared to some of the larger managers. Now, having given you a sense for what we trade, uh, sort of a diversified portfolio, the number of markets, uh, about 44 covering all the major sectors uh, on the major futures exchanges. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what are you trying to do and why are you doing what you do. So uh, we believe that the core benefit of a CTA or the core advantage of having a CTA in your portfolio is to be able to offset significant declines in the equity and bond markets. That is, declines that last for, say, a one month to six months or more, so longer periods. So we're not talking of necessarily providing a positive offset. By that, I mean equities are down, bonds are down, we're up on a day-to-day -day basis necessarily. So we've done that from time to time. Uh, but we're really talking of, say, one month and longer periods when there are sustained declines in the equity market, sustained declines in the bond markets. And then you want something in your portfolio that's going to offset that with positive returns. And historically, that has been the role of CTAs. And we've tried to make sure that our systems are designed to deliver on that promise that CTAs um, were designed to provide. So we're sort of portfolio insurance. So if you're a large manager or a large investor or a, you know, a small investor, and you have uh, some investments in equities, like a long-only strategy, like a, an ETF or a mutual fund, uh, or you actually directly own stocks, and then you also have a portfolio of bonds, we directly own bonds or a bond fund, then you want something that's going to give you an offset if they're going to be prolonged declines in these markets. So that's where CTA is coming. So roughly speaking, we have three groups of systems. Uh, groups one and two are primarily trend following. That is, they buy strength and sell weakness. Uh, they don't move too rapidly because you, ha you have to allow the market some wiggle room. Uh, but we've done something interesting in terms of how, we are, how much initial risk we are putting in, how we design our entries, how we design our exits to allow us to differentiate ourselves and give a little different performance profile than other trend followers in the business or other momentum traders in the business. So those are groups one and two. And group three, as we've discussed, is primarily our counterweight to groups one and two. That is, that allows us to reinforce this offset function that CTAs are meant to deliver. So that's sort of a quick overview of uh, why we do what we do. So uh, we do what we do so that we can diversify our portfolio of stocks and bonds. 
Uh, we have diversified uh, by trading in lot of markets. We have robust systems by using the same rules on all markets. But uh, we have, uh, we have uh, different philosophies that can be grouped together into three groups of systems that allow us to react. And uh, we've already shown you that our offense-defense ratio is more than one. So that tells you that our systems have proven themselves, proven this ability to uh, take advantage of opportunities and expand positions and then shrink them just as quickly when the trends uh, are not there. And of course, we're not trying to uh, to uh, extract any of the secret sauce, but I think it might be useful. You mentioned you have uh, six different models working inside the Altius program, but I, I do think it would be useful to try and, and maybe talk through um, you know, uh, maybe not all of them, but some of the key models, um, what kind of indicators uh, is involved, um, you know, does volatility play a, a, a role, and, and just to give a little bit more insight as to how you've designed the uh, individual models in order to achieve this overall uh, goal that you uh, just mentioned. So let's talk about our group one systems, which are primarily uh, trend following long short systems. So there are a variety of ways you can do this. You can do it using moving averages. You can do it using breakout style systems. Uh, you can use it um, using some sort of a fundamental model uh, or a, a predictive model from analytic uh, from fundamental data. Uh, you can do it using um, the term structure of interest rates, or you can do it by looking at the the structure of the various contracts and you know the forward contracts versus the current contracts and so on and so on. So there are many different ways of looking at the market, but fundamentally you have to decide: uh, uh, do you want to be long or do you want to be short? That is, do you think prices are going to go up, so you want to be long, or do you think prices are going to go down, and therefore you want to be short? And then you have to decide. Uh, how much to risk? Should I should you risk one percent, two percent, whatever, five percent, or whatever the magic number is? Maybe 0.3 percent for you. Uh, so you set some initial risk, and then you have to decide uh, what happens if you're wrong. So uh, say you put on the position and the market does something else. So when do you get out? And then you also have to decide what happens if things go your way. You know, uh, the, you you think you're going to go short, and the market obliges and goes short, uh, moves lower very rapidly or very nicely. Conversely, you think it's going to go higher and the market responds by going much higher. So you also have to decide when you get out, when you have a profitable trade. So they all these complex decisions, they all interact with each other. And uh, one of the challenges and one of the temptations in the business is that you could say that, uh, that uh, many, uh, it's very easy to think in terms of having market-specific models. So as we talked about, you could go to a bank and hire a, a bond trader. So the bond trader may have a lot of market-specific information and maybe good at trading information flow. But if you don't have information flow, then how do you design a market-specific system? So uh, one of the choices we could make upfront was to have a series of market-specific systems or uh, have robust systems. So we've chosen to use the same rules in all markets, so which means that we don't have any market-specific systems, So which means that we don't have a system that only trains bonds or nothing else. Now, uh, there's some uh, important reasons to do it this way. Uh, but that just gives you a sense for our philosophy in terms of what we're trying to do and how we're going about doing it. And you mentioned the choice between, say, moving averages and, and other types of uh, um, trend-following um, indicators. Which one did you choose, and, and is there a reason why uh, that you chose one over the other? Uh, we've uh, mostly gone with uh, breakout style systems as opposed to a moving average crossover type systems. Uh, to some extent, it's a, a matter of individual preference, but our uh, but we had two reasons to do it. The first reason is that when the markets are trading in a narrow trading range, that is, uh, they're just sort of going up and down, up and down in a relatively narrow range, uh, in that situation, a moving average system gives you a lot of unprofitable signals. So one way to avoid trading during a consolidation or a narrow uh, price range is to use breakout style systems. So that is one philosophical reason to avoid trading in a narrow trading range. The uh, other reason was that uh, you can be more creative in terms of defining whether you should get in or not. So uh, one, of the, one of the philosophical questions you can ask is, should you focus a lot of your energies in designing good entries or good exits or so on? And we've spent a lot of time trying to design good entries. That is, 
Um, if you look at the typical uh, trading system, a trend following trading system, it may only have 30 to 35 percent profitable trades. And we wanted to increase the percentage of winning trades. So that is why we went with uh, our breakout style strategy that we can combine with uh, a small number of conditions, maybe one or two or three, to improve the percentage of winning trades. So for most of our systems, uh, if you look at a long term test, the percentage of winning trades is closer to 45 to 50 percent in that range rather than say 25 to 35 percent. So uh, one of the key design features uh, of our program is even though we use the same rules on all uh, same rules on all markets, uh, we've still been able to structure our rules so that across a very broad set of very divergent, very different markets uh, over a very long period of time, we tend to get a higher proportion of winning trades compared to the typical trend following systems that you could easily find in the literature. And and is this choice of, of uh, using um, sort of price channels rather than moving averages, is that also a little bit of a consequence as to how you want to manage your risk and the use of uh, stops or not use of stops? Yes. Uh, the If you have uh, a moving average system, you typically tend to be always long or always short. So you have a large number of positions. So which means that uh, you have to somehow deal with equity curve with an equity curve that is full of markets that are not maybe going anywhere. Uh, whereas, so that tends to reduce your offense defense ratio. Whereas, if you have a breakout style system, you're trying to, you're essentially changing the nature of your equity curve by saying that we're trying to avoid taking positions in markets that are not experiencing s strong moves. So, uh, the challenge of managing the equity curve is different because you don't have a continuous equity curve composed of lots and lots of positions in lots and lots of markets, but you have a discontinuous equity curve with only a small number of positions uh, that can uh, expand or shrink. So when the markets are trending, you can have a large number of positions. When the markets are shrinking, you have a very small number of positions. So the volatility of the equity curve is not constant uh, or is not relatively stable as you would have if you had a moving average system, because in that case, you'd have a lot of positions on all the time. So uh, some different set of challenges, but on the other hand, it's a way to differentiate ourselves and uh, you know provide uh, something different like a good offense defense ratio. Sure, and and in terms of the inputs in the in your models uh, when you run them every day, what 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 kind of input do you need uh, in order to run uh, the Altius program? Uh, we just need the daily price data of open, high, low, and close. So, for example, uh, because we are a um, uh, a algorithmic or discipline or systematic program, that's all the information we need in terms of the daily open, high, low, close data. We don't need to have fundamental data or, or other sources of data or multiple contract data um, in order to make our decisions. And and how frequently do you then run the model in order to implement all these trades? Right. We are an end-of-day trader. So that means that we only have to run our model once a day after the trading has closed for the day. Uh, as opposed to say, if you're a moving average system, you might get a crossover in the middle of the day, then you have to decide whether you want to take it or not. Or if you're a very short term trader, you may be making a lot of intraday uh, data updates in order to get generate new signals. Whereas we are really only updating the data once a day uh, at the end of the day. So we are an end of day trader that, and we only have to do it once every uh, sort of trading cycle. And so what kind of orders do you have to implement uh, in order to uh, to run the strategy? What what kind of order types do you use? Uh, we primarily use three kinds of order types. That is, we have uh, spread orders when we have to roll over our positions. Uh, we occasionally use market orders to enter an exit position uh, if we have a new account or we have some sort of trading error. But uh, most of the time, we're just using uh, stop orders, So that these are, which means that uh, the price has to exceed a certain level, like rise above or fall below a certain level called the stop level or stop price before uh, the trade gets executed. And that means, if I understand you correctly, that you don't scale into any positions. You basically want to be uh, getting a full position on when you when, when a signal is triggered? Correct. Uh, again, this is a matter of design or a matter of uh, preference, and there are advantages or disadvantages to every approach. But the approach we've selected is to be all in or all out. So uh, we have stop orders and the entire position 
uh, will be put on uh, at one price point, uh, either put on or, or taken off at a single price point or as close to a single price point as we can get. Sure. So before putting on a, a position, how do you go about calculating? Because I guess that is a, a much bigger part than many people uh, are aware of. The position sizing and the use of leverage is obviously a very important part in in um, getting a success, successful result over time in, in the CTA industry. How do you go about that side of things? Uh, right. Now, uh, as we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about a moving average type system or a breakout style system and the difference in the equity curves. So um, our risk control is embedded in our design process because the number of positions we have on at any one time is not constant. Uh, conversely, if you had a moving average time system where you always had a position in the market either long or short, then you may have to adjust the positions over time more frequently. In our case, we have... Uh, looked at the long-term simulation of the system and determined a uh, initial risk level uh, at the market level or system level and the total uh, standard deviation for the simulated returns over a very long-term horizon. And we've combined the two to come up with what gives us reasonable risk control and drawdown risk control uh, over the course of the trading. And all the rules are automated, so in terms of day-to-day, we don't really have to think because that's all taken care of in our what we call our ITP or integrated trading platform. But um, as a, but really the data for the individual risk in any one to, for any one trade for any one system uh, in any one market and the overall uh, risk is all coming from our simulations, which cover a long time period and have various uh, checks and balances for robustness. But more interestingly, the uh, regardless of what our testing may have been. Uh, you can see and look at our real tri- real-time track record and see that we have controlled our risk uh, very well on a daily basis. As well as- Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.